I didn't know I had fewer. How, how much time is it? Oh, as long as I have. It's 8.30 if you have somewhere else to be tonight. <laughs> Take care of yourself. You can leave whenever you have to. Because I have no one else to be. <laughs> Jewish population three. <laughs> in Nashville, we have several synagogues. There's one main drag in Nashville called West End Avenue. If you start by the river and start moving away from Nashville proper, first comes the Orthodox show, then a few blocks later comes the conservative show, a few blocks later comes the more classical reform show, and then way out on the same <laughs> road is the uh, ultra-liberal reform center. So, I could, and it maybe the services were so beautiful, I could drive to Nashville, it's, a, it's about an hour. And, and maybe if the services were this good, I would go. <laughs> but probably not. <laughs> so I want to talk to you about three things. First one is I want to talk to you about this place. Then I want to talk to you about uh, India. And then I want to come back and talk to you about this place. And I promise it's going to make sense, either because it actually makes sense or I'll go on so long, you'll be so sleepy if it must have made sense, I just got it. <laughs> so let me talk about this place first. The building here is from the early 1920s. It's just got that incredible feel, you know, of, of the, that, that period. Gorgeous lights. Just a phenomenal space, this, this sanctuary. I grew up in a similar sanctuary, but it was orthodox. So we had an upstairs balcony where all the women were. That's where the real action was. The men were down here galvaning, but um, if you wanted to find out what was going on in the world, we went upstairs and did it with the women. And the difference between the shul I grew up with in and this one is my synagogue left the downtown Springfield, Massachusetts area, and you stayed. They abandoned the urban and went for the suburb. And when they did that, everything changed. First of all, you can't build this anymore. It's way too expensive. So in the 1960s, when my synagogue moved from this beautiful, ornate, ancient building with the, all the, the curves, you know, that, that this has got all the archways, I and mean, there's something deeply spiritual just about the rounded nature of it, they moved out to the suburbs and they built what could have been a Motel 6. <laughs> and they left the Nair Tamim on for you. <laughs> but it was, it could have been anything. It could have, it could have been anything. The synagogue in town became a church, which was good, because then it still had some, some spiritual vibrancy going on. But, when we moved to the suburbs, we left all our spiritual vibrancy back in that dome building. And we, it's very hard to get spiritual in a Motel 6. <laughs> the building was flat, and the music became flat, and the spirit became flat. And we were all living in this isolated ghetto in the suburbs. Now, we weren't the only ones. I'm not saying ours was the only synagogue. There was a conservative synagogue across the street and a reform synagogue around the corner. And their buildings were a little bit more naked than ours because they had moved there earlier before it was so expensive. But we all competed on who could be the most boring. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing was happening in those synagogues. Now, the Orthodox synagogue is no longer there. My dad dobbins every day, and now he dobbins at the conservative show. He was very nervous about it. They had a, they had a woman rabbi, which, you know, that freaked him out. But, she lays tefillin, she puts tefillin on in the morning, he was cool with that. But the smartest thing they did when they, when the Orthodox synagogue closed and they invited the members to join the conservative is they took the seats, you know, this these rows, they took them out of the Orthodox shul and they put them in the back of the sanctuary in the conservative shul so my dad could sit in the same seat with all his friends in their old seats, <laughs> molded to their butts for decades of years. <laughs> and he felt at home. You 
stay. Now I know when I first moved here in the 80s, you tried to go to Kendall. You had a satellite in Kendall. And it was a fun place to be. But I, for whatever reason, we decided to focus here, which I think is great. But what do you do with this now? Which brings me to India. Yeah, I think you should move the whole place to India. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's just hold that thought. I'm leaving you hanging here. I want to talk about India, and then we'll come back. So in September of 2012, I was in India. It was my second trip to India. I was invited to be part of a lecture series with the Dalai Lama. That's my big name drop for the night. I got to share the podium with the Dalai Lama. I didn't really share it, he had it to himself, I was sitting on the other side, but <laughs> when it was my turn to speak, he actually moved away, so I didn't really share it with him, but we were at the same podium, and we were there to celebrate the 150th birthday of Swami Vivekananda. So you all know Swami Vivekananda? Yeah. So, no, I know you. <laughs> so Swami Vivekananda is famous because he came to the United States, Chicago, in 1893, as part of what was the very first parliament of the world's religions. It was part of a world's fair. They didn't call it a world's fair. I don't know what they called it. But we today would call it a world's fair. And as part of the world's fair, they had this parliament of the world's religions. The first time in the history of humanity that representatives of every religion came together unarmed. And Swami Vivekananda gave a keynote address. And what he talked about was the future of religion. And I don't know what he said, but I'm sure it was interesting. <laughs> and if I had been there, I would have been impressed. Of course, if I had been there, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Even Obamacare can't pull out. <laughs> so we were there to celebrate his 150th birthday. And we were at a, an ashram, a Hindu center that he founded in Delhi. And there's, there were thousands and thousands of people there. And there were hundreds and hundreds of monk swamis, Hindu swamis. And I got to speak to a lot of them in, in small groups. And one of the, the, the one question that kept coming up over and over again with the swamis and myself, they kept asking me, why Judaism? Why is it? Why does it exist? What's your mission? You know, and they said, our mission, this is for the Swami, said, our mission is clear. We believe that everyone is trapped in ignorance and we're going, to, you know, we're going to bring them out of that ignorance into what they call moksha, which is liberation. Liberation from the cycle of birth and death. They believe that you just get reborn and reborn and reborn over and over and over again until you realize that you're a spark of God and when you realize that, you don't come back. So there, you know, in America, we love reincarnation. We want to come back. This time I only got the Lexus, and next time I want the BMW. You know, we come back for the material goods that we imagine reincarnation has in store for us. We always come back better. We're learning. We're always learning. You know, the next level, the next level, the next level. In, in Hinduism, you're just repeating the same grade over and over and over again, and you really just want to get off the wheel. So there, they have a succinct answer. answer. We exist, Hinduism, Hindus, we exist help people break the cycle of birth and death and rebirth. The Buddhists who were there, of course, in one of the conversations we had, there were a couple of Buddhist monks, lamas, Tibetans, and they said, oh, well, we know why we exist. We, we exist to end suffering. And the Buddha's four noble truths. Life is suffering. Suffering is called by, caused by your desire, clinging. If you stop clinging to things, you'll stop suffering, and then they have Point four is their eightfold path. So it's really a thirteenfold thing, but they figured that would be hard to sell. So they sold a four point thing, but number four was really eight parts. <laughs> so it's tricky to resist. But it was all about suffering and the ending of suffering. Everybody suffers, so Buddhism has a built in market. If you believe you keep coming back and you want to stop coming back, then obviously Hinduism has a built in market also. But it's tougher for the Hindus because they have to sell you one reincarnation before they can sell you in Hinduism. Buddhists say, Do you suffer? You say yes. And then they tell you how to stop suffering. That's why there's so many Jews who are Buddhists. Especially in Because we know we're suffering. 
That's our religion. We didn't realize we were Buddhists. That's it. <laughs> so then they say, so what, what's with your religion? So I quoted them from Genesis 12, verse 3. Everyone know that? <laughs> no, that's what's wrong with Judaism. Right? <laughs> that's it. Probably couldn't recite the Four Noble Truths either. So. so Genesis 12, verse 3. God is telling Moses in verse 1 that he and Sarah, Moses, Abraham, Abraham and Sarah need to leave town. They have to get out of the conditioning of where they find themselves. And they're going to go to another place, Holy Land. And there, God says, you will be a source of blessing for all the families of the earth. And that's 12 3. We're supposed to be a source of blessing for all the families of the earth. So that's why I told them that that's why we exist. We're not going to end suffering. We're not worried about coming back. We want to be a source of blessing for all the families of the earth. Now, when they wrote the Bible, they probably meant only human families. Today, we would be even more sensitive. We would have a broader sense of family. So all sentient beings, all live, all life. All the species of this planet. Our mission is to be a vehicle of blessing for all the living. No, none of them want to convert because we have that circumcision thing. <laughs> and they're all men that I was talking to. They're not supposed to cling, but there was something they were clinging to their four skins and they weren't exactly. Hey, that's nice, let's do it. What do you do? I said, Well, I have this knife and oh. <laughs> So we have a built-in marketing problem that they may not have, but <laughs> they were impressed with the fact that we exist to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Hinduism is talking about individuals, and I love Hinduism, and I love, I love religion. It drives me crazy, but I'm absolutely fascinated by it. And I teach comparative religion. This is my life. So I'm not knocking these religions any more than I knock my own, but Hinduism is about the individual attaining liberation. Buddhism is about the individual ending her suffering. Judaism is about the Jewish community going out and living in such a way as to be a blessing for all the families of the earth. Ours is other-directed. We figure, you know, if we get to heaven, if there's a heaven, if we, you know, it's because we're a blessing. We don't worry about that. Actually, last Thursday I was giving a lecture at the Middle of Tennessee State University, and one of the things that class, not my own, as a visiting lecturer, and one of the things that students couldn't get, 99% of the students at the university where I work, are evangelical Christian things. Some happily and some very unhappily. And they said, I don't get it, don't you worry about life after death? And I said, no, that's not our concern. Our concern is life right here. If we live this life in a manner that makes, our, makes us a blessing, then things will work out, it'll be fine. And they were like, no, I, I, I can't live that way. I, I need to know that I'm going to have eternal life in the world to come. I said, well, you need to know, so congratulations. You can have eternal life in the world to come. <laughs> now you should be a blessing. So for us, it's, it's, Judaism occupies this unique space in the spectrum of the world's religions. By and large, religions are about the liberation, the enlightenment, or the salvation of the individual. Less so in Islam. Islam is much more like Judaism. But Judaism is not on that spectrum. Ours is a, an, an effort by the community for the larger community. And they were impressed by that. I am astounded by that. Every time I remind myself that's why we're here. We only exist for that purpose. We don't exist to, to keep buildings alive. We don't exist for the sake of fundraisers. We don't exist for bingo. My, my aunt lives in Springfield, and she runs the bingo at um, the Jew Jewish Community Center. That's her big thing during the week. She's in her late 80s. And this is how she gives back to the community. And that's her Judaism. Right? But that's really not Judaism, unless playing bingo is somehow being a blessing. Running the bingo for the community is a blessing. We exist for this blessing work. But how many of our kids are taught that? How many of us are taught that? How many of us get 
get up every morning and say, I'm a Jew. What am I going to do to be a blessing today for all the families of the earth? And I don't know the answer to that, but that's a question we should ask ourselves. Judaism is not static. What it meant to be a blessing in Moses' time is quite, or Abraham's time, is quite different probably than what we might imagine being a blessing is today. Their worlds were way different than ours. So it's not that we can look in the past, look to the past, and say, oh, okay, this is what it is to be a blessing. I have to imitate what they did, and therefore, and, and that's the way I'll, I'll be a blessing here and now. That's not how it works. Abraham's Judaism wasn't the same as Moses' Judaism. Moses' Judaism was very different than Hillel's Judaism. Hillel's Judaism is very different than the Judaism of today. We have similar language, but the way we do things is very different, and the sensibilities and the sensitivities we have are very different. We change. The principles don't. We're here to be a blessing, but what blessing means changes. And the only way we know how it changes is if we engage in conversation with one, with one another about what it means to be a blessing to all the families of the earth, which brings me back to this building. What do you do with this place? Now, if I've got my math right, you're in your 90th something birthday, right? Yeah. Right? I don't mean you personally, but some of us are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I mean the building itself, the synagogue itself. 91? So, okay, so the congregation is 91 years old. I mean, that's amazing. How, just out of curiosity, when you leave your site, how many, how far back do you go? All the way. You go back, so, so you're going to read from someone who died 91 years ago, maybe? I mean, I think that's phenomenal. That's continuity for almost a century. That there's somebody here in this place. Now, I know the place wasn't here 91 years ago. But there's continuity in this community that remembers people who died almost a century ago. I mean, how amazing is that? How important is that for those who are members of the community? But that's not being a blessing to all the families of the earth. But that is being a blessing to those people keeping their memory alive. You can't, you can't underestimate how important it is to read the names on the doors of those especially when you have this kind of history. But you're going to come up on your 100th birthday. What for? Right. So, in India, they asked why Judaism, the answer is to be a blessing. So now I want to bring the question to this community to say, how are you a blessing? What blessing do we need now as we move into the, or well into the 21st century, where Judaism in the 21st century is not the same as what Judaism was when this congregation first started? What does it mean to be an urban congregation? What does it mean to be the sacred space that carries, I can't do the math, but it was built in 27. Somebody help me out. How many every year that, how many number of years that is? But it carries that spirit. You can feel it. You can feel it in the fixtures. Thank God nobody in 1950 said, you know, let's make it modern. <laughs> no, maybe it's just too high to reach if you want to bother, but I'm glad. You know, it's got you, the, the place resonates with almost a century of spiritual depth and grace and struggle and tragedy and triumph. All of these walls, it's so amazing. So it seems to me that a place this old has a mission more than a younger congregation. A community that's going to celebrate its 100th birthday soon, I think has a mission for the next 100 years. And this is where, I'm, it's just my opinion, everything else was gospel. <laughs> <laughs> now it's my opinion. Right? Which is also gospel if you agree with me. If you don't, You've been wrong before. <laughs> so here's what I think has to happen in a place like this. This place, if, if the idea is to let's make it what it was before, let's fill all the seats, what can we do to drag Jews in here? To fill all these seats, then we'll think we're a success. I, 
think that's a losing proposition. This isn't where Jews are going. Now we may have to give up the radio. What we should be doing is, because the radio costs a lot of money, I imagine, but live streaming through iPhones and iPads and What's it called? Brand X? I can't remember what Brand X is, but Google and all that stuff. That, you know, if, if you want to reach people where they are and they're not here, maybe you do that kind of thing where the synagogue service is put on the cloud, you know, and someone can download it and, and watch it live or watch it later. I mean, maybe that's something that you might want to consider. But if the idea is you're going to have to fill the seats again, I don't think that's ever going to happen. I think that time is over. So what do you do? I suggest that you turn this incredible campus into a place of creative foment. Fomenting a revolution, fomenting new ideas, or to like the word ferment better, that be a place where, where stuff starts to transform into something else, the fermentation process, where some things are, are rotting and something else is sweet and affirming is, is coming out of that. That Temple Israel could be the East Coast center for creative experiments in Jewish life, not just religious life, but the full gamut of the Jewish civilization, Jewish culture. That there could be, every couple of years, a conference here. You certainly have the space. You certainly have the weather. conference here on different things. So let's say you do one on Jewish leadership. You're familiar with TED Talks? Mm -hmm. right. Make this a place for, what do you mean TED? Tom Talks. <laughs> I don't know, you find another, another acronym, right? But, a, what? Tomorrow. Okay. Right. So, so, a place for tomorrow Talks, or a place where we come together with the same idea of, of using technology and education and design, but we would add spirit to it. And think about, just no holes barred, a place of, of experimentation with ideas about what Judaism could be. So, two years from now you have a conference on the future of Jewish leadership, and you invite people who are not the standard people, not the people who make it into who's who in American Judaism, because that's really the people who brought us to where we are now. And this is the best I can do. I don't want to listen to them. <laughs> a few years ago, the organization Synagogue Transformation and Renewal invited me to uh, help put together a conference of Jewish movers and shakers. And they invited all the people who were at the heads of, of synagogues all around the country, large synagogues. And I said, these are the wrong people. First of all, these are the people who are making a lot of money, making good salaries on the status quo. So they don't want to change anything. And secondly, the status quo that they've given us is not really attracting anyone in the future. So they've succeeded, but their success is ultimately going to be the failure of tomorrow. We invite the wrong people. We have to invite people we never heard of. People who are just coming up with new ideas that nobody wants to listen to because they seem so outrageous. But maybe in that conversation with some of these creative, on the edge thinkers, new ideas would come that people would test, would try. That Temple of Israel become a place where all kinds of ideas are just spun out. Now, the congregation itself could test things. This could also be not just a think tank, but a place for baby testing. You could try stuff real people in a real congregation to see what works and what doesn't, at least for you. And then say, no, nah, this one needs tweaking or this one is never going to work or this is great. So maybe a conference on Jewish leadership where we reimagine what it is to be a Jewish leader, whether we're talking about cantors or rabbis or, or uh, educators, synagogue presidents, maybe the whole idea of a country club synagogue and you join, there's membership dues. Maybe there's a new model we have to explore new kind of leaders that would be more, lead us in a different direction. A few a couple of years after that, maybe you do uh, a conference on creative liturgies, not just what passes for spirituality in so many synagogues, hand clapping. 
Now, in a lot of places, if you clap hands, we are spiritual. <laughs> you know, and that's that song. If you're spiritual and you know it, clap your hands. <laughs> You know, a lot of us went to, to Jewish camps, and we were all on Jewish camp, right? So we clap, and we drink bug juice. <laughs> we bug juice. And we think, ah, oh, that's so spiritual. But I don't know what spirituality is in the 21st century. We could explore that. What might that mean? What might it mean to be a blessing in the 21st century? How might synagogues, how might Jews carry that forward? This place with such history could then be the anchor in, in a power, in a positive way, I don't mean anchor dragging you back. With such history, this place has gravitas. This place could be an anchor that speaks to the next hundred years. But it would take a tremendous amount of courage. It doesn't take that much money. It takes a lot. I'm not saying it's free. But I've been running these TED Talks in Nashville for two years in a row, and it doesn't cost that much money. People want to do it. People want to come together and share these cutting edge ideas, whatever they may be. I haven't really suggested any. I don't know what they think. But they want to dialogue with one another, and there's no place to do it. Because the internet, as great as it is, isn't, good, isn't as good as people sitting around together, seeing, looking at one another, talking face to face. We do that less and less and less. But Temple Wizard could be a place where that's done deeper and deeper and deeper. This could be a center for creative Jewish dialogue to see what is next, what's the possibility. I wouldn't say give up services. I'm not saying give up Sunday school. I'm not saying you get rid of bar and bar mitzvah. I know a lot of 12-year-olds who would like that, but I'm not saying any of that. There could be a core congregation that keeps doing what all congregations do. I'm not, I'm not arguing about that. But you have so much more than that going on here. So I'm not going to belabor the point because I don't work here. If I did, I'd be calling you individually and saying, you know, you should make a donation for this. But I'm not going to do that to you. Yeah. Tom is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if, if you've got the funds, yeah, you want to leave it to your kids, but not all of that. <laughs> right? They don't deserve all of that. <laughs> But to leave a legacy, do you know if you ever read the book of class, the Ecclesiastes, he says, don't leave it to your kids, you're just going to waste it. But if you created something that was dynamic, that looked forward a hundred years, that's a legacy. And that's a powerful legacy to live, to leave. So, when asked, what is this Jewish thing? Why are we this? Why have we existed for thousands of years? The answer is to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. And then when the question next is how, I said, well, we're working on it. <laughs> and this is the place on the East Coast where that work is happening. It would be a tremendous gift to give yourselves for your 100th birthday and to give to Judaism globally for their second 100th birthday. Thank you. Good job.